This video is an excerpt from our SR Lounge premium workshops. To learn more or purchase, simply go to srlounge.com forward slash store. My name is Pai and enjoy the video. So how does a camera work? Um, let's understand some of the basics, the terminology, because in all reality, ever since they started making cameras, the fundamentals have been the same, the elements have been the same. They might have changed the icons, the button placements, these little details, but the way they actually work, it's been the same since we started making cameras, even back in the film days. Well, and of course, a hundred years ago, we didn't really have buttons. But right, okay. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but he's absolutely right in that, you know, most of the components as far as the aperture, the shutter speed, the sensor, I mean, we went from film to sensors, but everything has stayed the same, ISO and so forth. All right, so, well, where should we start? Let's start with lenses. Okay, well, the first thing I'd probably bring up is the focal lengths. Mm. Let's talk about focal lengths. So here in my hand, I have an 18 to 55. What do you got? I've got a 55 to 50. Okay, so the focal length is measured in millimeters and basically the lower that number. So if we go from 18 to 14 to 13 to 10, the wider it is getting. If I wanted that wide view, I would be on the 18 of your lens or the 55 of my lens. Mm -hmm. But if I wanted to zoom in and maybe narrow into a portrait, then I'd be on the uh, bigger number side. So like the 250 on mine or what are you on again? Well, I can only go up to 55. So okay. the way that they've, they've designed these kit lenses is basically one lens kind of picks up where one left off. So the widest you can get on the 55 to 250 is 55. The tightest is at 250. And the widest I can get on this is 18 millimeters. The tightest is 55 millimeters. But of course there are tons of different lenses that vary in range, but that's just the basic rule on, on focal lengths. Okay. So that's how it works. The lower the number, the wider the angle, and then the higher the number, the tighter, the more zoomed you're going to be. Right. Okay. So, well, let's talk about the aperture. What is the aperture? because that's the next component of a lens that kind of matters. So the aperture is kind of like the pupil of your eye. So let's say I went into the bathroom and the lights are on and bright. What happens to my pupil? It'll shrink down. And that's pretty much what the aperture in a lens does. It opens and it closes and it controls the amount of light that comes in. Do you do this often in bathrooms? You look in the mirror. When I'm doing my pupil. selfies, <laughs> I will flick the light switch on and off and watch my pupils. <laughs> Open and close. <laughs> but yeah, that, you're exactly right. That happens too when, uh, let's say you're in a movie theater, you're watching a movie, and then you just step directly outside. Um, it's super bright. It almost like you can actually hurt your eyes. Well, it's not, I don't think it can damage them, but maybe if it's bright enough. But it does like, it's physically uncomfortable, right? Right. So you step outside and it takes a couple minutes for those, for your eyes to adjust, your pupils, they close down and it lets in less light. The exact same thing happens on a lens. And I have here a manual aperture lens that I can actually show you guys. So let me see here where my little dial is. I have a little uh, aperture preview lever here. So if you notice, this is at its widest open setting, okay? I can actually close down the aperture to let in less and less light. It does something else too. When we have a wide open aperture, not only are we letting in more light, but we're also, uh, well, it's doing something else. What is it doing from an artistic standpoint? Now, if you guys like that blurry look where maybe I'm looking at Pi and he's in focus and everything behind him is blurred, that's because I controlled my aperture. And if I opened it up really, really wide, he would be in focus and everything else would be blurred. Now, if I squint my eyes, right? Yeah, absolutely. That would be like brazing the aperture to that highest setting where it kind of closes down. Then everything sharpens. So as you get older, you're trying to do this to read. <laughs> Same thing. She would not know this because she's super young. Right. But um, yes, that's exactly right. So we're controlling the depth of field with our aperture, right? right. So the wider the aperture, the larger that opening, the less depth of field we have, meaning more blur in the background, more blur behind your subject or wherever you're focusing, the smaller you go down. Again, the less light we allow in, we allow in much, much less light, and we also increase the depth of field, so the more of the image is gonna be sharp. And what's that called? That, blurry, that? that blurry effect? Oh, the blurry effect. Yeah. Bokeh. Say it again. Bokeh. It's pronounced like, well, everybody says it in kind of a different way. Right. And that's totally fine. The correct pro uh, pronunciation of, I almost said pronunciation. The correct pronunciation of bokeh is bow like bow and arrow and ke like kettle. Right. 
And it's a Japanese it's word. It's a Japanese actually. word. That's right. And, and the, the interesting thing about that term, we we often use that term just to just just to talk about the blur, basically. But the actual definition is talking about the aesthetic quality of the blur. So you'd say a lens has great quality to the bokeh. You'd say that, but it really doesn't matter. If we say bokeh, we're basically referring just to that blurry area. All right, so light passes through our aperture. Now, the aperture is actually a component of what you mentioned earlier, the exposure triangle. Right, that was actually number one for us. Yeah, so that's the first component. Light passes through the aperture, the aperture controls the amount of light going through, and then it reaches the inside of the camera. Now, this is the interesting part. I'm gonna take this lens off. Now, I wouldn't necessarily recommend taking lenses off and leaving them <laughs> leaving them off the camera but what do you see inside of there that is a mirror that is a mirror check this out see this little mirror here when you look through the viewfinder a lot of people think that they're seeing the sensor or they're seeing basically yeah where the image is recorded but in reality what are they actually seeing a mirror a actually mirror. i used to think that it i was looking through the lens that was we, wrong too we all did we always thought that that's how it worked but um when we look through the viewfinder there's actually another mirror it's sometimes referred to as a pentamir or pentaprism on the top of the camera and basically where the light comes in so it goes in through the aperture it hits this mirror it reflects up to that pentamir and then it comes through the viewfinder so what you're actually seeing is just these reflections coming off the mirror. All right, so let's flip this up. This is the part that I would not recommend doing. So we're going to flip the mirror up and you guys can see inside there's an actual little door here. You see that little door? She already knows all this stuff. I can't She's believe like you're actually doing pro. this. I know, right? Look at that. It's kind of cool to look at that. Right, but yes. No, you're giving me the heebie-jeebies. All right, this is my camera, so... It's a, my old camera, so it doesn't really matter. Um, so you can see the shutter right underneath that. So like Michelle said, when the mirror flips up, that's when the light hits the shutter. The shutter opens to reveal the sensor, and then the image is recorded on the sensor. Now, our aperture controlled the amount of light, right? What does right. the shutter control? The shutter controls the duration in which your sensor is going to be exposed. Exactly. And then we talked about how basically every component kind of has that exposure-related side and the artistic-related side. So what is the artistic side? So hold on. This is, by the way, number two of our exposure triangle. Oh, yes. This is number two of the exposure triangle. Okay, so shutter speed. Tell so, me your question again. My question was if, okay, so on the after side, we had that exposure and the artistic related function. Right. What about the shutter speed side? Now, if I want to see motion, I can drag my shutter, meaning slow it down, or if I want to freeze it, then I can speed it up. Okay, so that's the artistic side. The faster the shutter, you're freezing action. The slower the shutter, you're capturing or showing motion. Okay, perfect. So now we expose the image or we expose the light to the sensor. And then the magic happens. The sensor records the image, but it goes to like a little, it goes to like a little image heaven for just a couple of minutes. <laughs> we refer to that as the buffer. Actually, we don't call it image heaven. We just call it the buffer. <laughs> okay, so when it's in the buffer, this is when the camera is gonna basically process the image. So if you're shooting a JPEG, or if you have unique artistic filters or anything applied to that image, it's gonna record the image on the sensor, transfer it to the buffer, it's gonna process it in the buffer, before it sends it to the memory card. Interesting note, if you shoot raw, well, the image is not being processed at all. It's going raw straight from the sensor. Well, it's gonna hit the buffer, but it's not gonna be processed in there, and then it's gonna go directly to the memory card unprocessed. So hold on, let me rewind that. Raw goes straight to the memory card. JPEG, it gets cooked up a little bit inside of your camera, sits in your buffer and then goes to your memory card. Well, even if you're shooting a standard JPEG, it still will process it in camera. A JPEG without any additional settings applied to it, there's still picture styles basically. It will adjust contrast, saturation, sharpness, and it still does that basic raw processing in camera. So really, if you ever want just a final JPEG image, it has to be processed somewhere, right. either on your computer or on the camera, it needs to be done. All right, so that's where our raw file, we would either get the raw file on our memory card or we would get the final JPEG on the memory card and then it goes to our computer where we do what? All kinds of good magic. Good magic, bad magic is not good. Avoid the bad <laughs> magic. But basically we would go and do additional processing. We'd use Lightroom or Aperture or Capture One. Now this is really kind of more well, beyond the scope of this workshop, processing in and of itself is really half the artistry to photography. And there's so many different things to learn, which is why we have the Lightroom Workshop Collection. We use Lightroom primarily in the studio. So for anyone that wants to learn the processing side, be sure to check out the Lightroom Workshop Collection because it teaches everything from A to Z. All right, so let's do a quick recap. We have first our lens, which determines... Field of view. Field of view. Our light enters the lens and goes through the... 
aperture. Which controls? The amount of light that's coming in. This is like a test, she has no idea. <laughs> I know, I'm just running with this. <laughs> the light goes through the aperture which controls our amount of light coming in and then it hits the shutter, the shutter door opens and does. For a certain amount of time and then it exposes our sensor. It gets transferred to? The buffer and then into the memory card. Dude, found it. Right. He's a pro. Can you cover this now, please? <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Our camera's naked. We need to put its clothes back on. Okay, so that is the recap. Now, when it comes to different types of cameras, really, well, everything kind of stays the same for the most part. Even when we talk about um, film to digital, there's just small differences. For example, uh, let's talk about going from digital back to film. What changes from digital back to film? It's sensor to film. Exactly. So instead of recording on a sensor, a digital sensor, we're just recording on film. How about, this is, it, it's like already in the name. We have a mirrorless DSLR right. here with the Sony. There's no mirror at all. It just There's goes no straight, mirror. straight to the sensor. Okay. So if I did this, now this is a very nice camera and I'm going to do a no-no too. Well, you pop the lenses off on this. You have to make sure on a mirrorless camera that you turn it off. When this thing is on, it attracts dust like crazy. But you can see the sensor inside of here. This is actually a full frame sensor. Check this guy out. It's kind of cool to look at, right? Okay, so uh, my <laughs> acquisition syndrome is turning on right now. <laughs> All right. So this is missing that mirror. So basically, when we, uh, with these mirrorless cameras, when you look through that viewfinder, what you're seeing is actually an electronic view. They're called EVFs, electronic viewfinders. And you're seeing basically what the sensor is seeing. So this is a different technology, but everything else still works the same way. Our aperture, our shutter speed, and our ISO. These three components of the exposure triangle, they work the same way regardless of the camera type, whether it's film, whether it's digital, mirrorless digital, and so forth. These things have been the same since the beginning of the time, and I assume they're probably going to be the same for a very long time. Right, right. <laughs> All right, so are we done here? I think so. I'm ready to move on. I'm ready to move on too. I think you guys understand how to use a camera. We understand how to use a camera now, or how, no. We understand how a camera works. Right, Not but yet we'll how walk to use everybody it. through how to use it next. All right, well, let's head on to the next video.